Welcome back to YPO Presents. If you're watching us live, just remember you can enter your comments down below as we go through the broadcast and we'd love to interact with you. If you're not following YPO Presents already, you can do so, please do so, so you can receive a notification when the next episode comes about. It's my pleasure to introduce Sherry Leventon. Sherry is a best-selling author of a rockin' book on sales called Heart and Sell. She's a guest lecturer at Harvard's Strategic Sales Management Program, and she's LinkedIn's top voice in sales. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning, Dave. Thrilled to be here with all of you. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is probably the most important topic facing leaders, decision-making. Now, decision-making is difficult because by its nature, it involves uncertainty. If there was no uncertainty, decisions would be easy. The uncertainty exists because, well, we don't know the future. We don't know if the decisions we make will lead to the best possible outcomes. And I believe the biggest decision facing leaders today is how to re is how to strategically repivot our businesses. Now, lately, I've been engaged in conversations with countless leaders who are wondering what to do. Some of them lead teams, others own successful businesses, and all of us are concerned about the health and welfare of our employees, our colleagues, our communities, and ourselves. So there's no clear roadmap right now, no concrete timeline available for how long this uncertainty will last, and no accurate estimates of the social and economic impacts. So what we can do as leaders though, is make decisions based on a proven process. And that's why I'm thrilled that you're all here. And I'm even more thrilled to introduce David Garrison, who's gonna give us that exact process on how to make good decisions in a time of complete uncertainty, which we're all in right now. So a few of Dave's credentials, and I couldn't make a decision what to leave out, but here's just a few of them. Uh, Dave has served in officer roles at the local, regional, and international levels for YPO. He's had success for over 25 years as a CEO and independent board member of public and private companies, both in the U.S. and internationally. And today he leads Garrison Growth, a company, a global com company with a proven track record of increased sales, employee engagement, and profitability, all things we need right now. Dave holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. He's an avid sailor, accomplished pilot, and fierce, yet, let me tell you from experience, mediocre golfer. So Dave, why don't you take it from here? And I'm dying to hear this four-step process. We've talked about it a little bit, and I've employed some of these in my own business, but I'm excited to hear you elaborate on it for our group today. Thanks, Sherry. You know, as a technology communication CEO for dozens of years, I've sat in so many strategic planning sessions. And the way we pivot is let's get in a room or go away somewhere or meet virtually, and we'll throw around ideas until we get something that most people agree to or the boss tells us what to do. This morning, I want to suggest to you there's a much better way, backed up by research and by experience. It's a primarily a four-step process. There's actually a hidden fifth step, but we'll tell you about that later. The four steps are to, first of all, have the leader clearly define a desired outcome. And that's the part most leaders get intuitively. They do it all the time. Here's what I want us to achieve. In the time of strategic repivoting, that might look like our business has changed significantly. How do we leverage our assets and reapply them to fulfill our vision and serve customers' needs that we don't know about today. Desired outcome is the first step. The second step, this usually doesn't happen, is being explicit about assumptions. The third step is being explicit about criteria, where criteria is the checklist in the head. And the fourth and fun part, that you never know what's gonna happen, we call weighing the ox, not animal husbandry. We'll talk about what weighing the ox means in a minute. But first, a story. Tom Flanagan is the CEO of a major manufacturing company. His two vice presidents were shocked to learn that their largest, their largest customer canceled their orders and switched to their most fierce competitor. Tom blamed his VP of sales for not being on top of the account. The VP of sales blamed the VP of manufacturing 
for having inefficient processes and costs that were too high. I know that's never happened to you and you've never seen that situation. <laughs> Here's what Tom did. He asked the team, what do you think we should do? And the team was silent. They'd been through this drill before and they knew if they gave the wrong answer, they'd have their heads chopped off, particularly when there was so much pressure on. So Tom waited patiently for an answer and he remembered his team almost never answers him first. So he went ahead. He went ahead and he said, <clears throat> you know what I think we should do? We should do this and we should do that and we should do the other. And then laid out his plan. At the end, Tom was curious to know what his team thought of what he had to say. So he said, what do you all think of my plan? It's a scene repeated in different scenarios in companies all over the world. And on the face of it, it makes good sense. It's usually the person that speaks first that leads the conversation or the loudest or the person with the biggest title. And what we're gonna to suggest to you is that's not a very effective way to come up with a strategy pivot. It's inefficient and sometimes devastating way to make important decisions. So let me ask you this, take a second on your own and identify what you think went wrong in that scenario. Feel free to enter that into the chat in a couple of words if you'd like. So Tom, like so many leaders, has so much experience in solving problems. His solutions, though, were limited by his own biases and his own experience. And when he asked the team, what do you think, he's shaping the conversation to be, what do you think about my ideas? Not what do you think we might do or what do you think we could do or what do you think a preferred alternative looks like? This process denied all the team members an opportunity to leverage their own experience, their own insights, and their own education. And that is not an effective way. So we have a different way of approaching it. Dave, I, I, there's, I, I'm, my mind is on fire here. And of course, there's so many things that Tom did wrong. We could go on a lot of different tangents here. But what really strikes me is this lack of consensus. You know, and particularly today, what we know about millennials is people would rather be part of the conversation than to listen to the conversation. And not getting consensus is particularly dangerous for leaders because, well, think about it. We're creatures of habit. If you've read Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, he has some interesting statistics. And I love this. If you think about it, 90% of everything we do, we do by habit. So how we brush our teeth, how we park our cars, how we choose employees, how we make decisions, it's happening subconscious, which is really problematic when it comes to making decision making. Because if we don't get consensus, we limit our ability to have new ideas. Think about your own life for a minute. Think about BC, before coronavirus. And think about even just your habitual footpath, right? You probably went to the same Starbucks. Uh, you drove down the same road. If you were in an office, you went up the same elevator. What we do is very habitual and therefore who we see, who we surround ourselves with, look around, do they look like you, smell like you, act like you? Very often they do. What happens is we only have mirrors for our own opinions. And you and I were talking the other day, Dave, about Abraham Lincoln and the great story of him surrounding himself and knowing that he needed a team of rivals. Because only if we have opposing opinions can we generate new ideas. So I just wanted to share um, two action items here for everybody listening that you might want to do because you all have big decisions to make right now. And this might seem challenging, but I want you to think of the most annoying person in your company or in your social network but one who's smart and one who respect, but one who annoys you. And I want you to connect with them and ask their opinion. You'll be surprised once you have the tolerance to do that. The other thing is, again, widen your social network. Start saying yes to things you normally wouldn't say yes with. Most of us are working from home. Connect with people who have opposing views to your own. And everything you said, Dave, will really help you weigh that ox and make better decisions. So um, yeah, great, great comments there. So when you connect with a person who has views that you know are different, that's your opportunity to get really curious and understand what mm -hmm. their beliefs are. So let's reframe what Tom might have done. 
in the four-step process. The first thing Tom would have done as CEO is to find a clear outcome. And that clear outcome would be within six months, I want to replace the revenue that this big customer has caused us to lose. And that's great because everybody knows what problem they're trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. And that's not exactly a strategy. That's more of a tactic because right now we need to focus on that. And then the part that is not done in most organizations is for the leader to write down their assumptions, write down their assumptions. So Tom might have been thinking, let's replace this customer with three or four customers so we don't have a concentration issue. Um, he might be thinking uh, his assumptions are it's not worth trying to win back this customer because the margins would be too low. He might be thinking we can only win them back if we compete on price. So list out sp specific assumptions. And then the criteria is the next thing for Tom to list out on his own, just write down criteria. Criteria is the checklist in his head. If we brought Tom 10 ideas, he could look at three of them and go, Poof, I don't like those. He could look at three and say, hmm, they're pretty interesting. And he could look at the others and go, eh, I don't know. So Tom has a checklist in his head. We just don't know what it is. So to serve the team in the conversation, Tom needs to write down his checklist so he can share it with the team. The next step then is to get together with the team and ask the team, do they understand the clearly defined outcome? Do they have any thoughts on his assumptions? Do they agree with those assumptions? Are they worth discussing? And likewise with the criteria. And so by doing that, we actually gain much broader thinking and much better thinking because we're not limited by Tom's experience. We're now calling into everybody's experience into play. And that really works. And it takes a really confident leader to do that, right? To realize that um, there's more genius perhaps in front of me than in front of them. And it takes confidence to be able to do that. I always tell leaders, just because you get the title leader doesn't mean now you need to be chief information officer, right? And, and great leaders really do um, get rid of their egos and ask for that consensus. So so Dave, I'm, conf I'm curious, what do those steps actually look like? Um, can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, so um, these three steps, the first one is the leader identifying clear outcome and just checking in. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm asking for? Then the group gets together and the leader shares the assumptions and asks and invites discussion about those assumptions and asks, are additional assumptions that I should have added that I missed? Are there additional criteria I should have missed uh, that I should have included? Um, and so that discussion forms a rich framework. So everyone knows what they're trying to solve for. Everyone can bring their experience to bear. Everyone can bring their ideas to bear in a very focused and effective way. Sometimes we like to say, you have to slow down to speed up. And, and let me be clear, this process works on almost any decision that you make unless there's an emergency. Look, I'm a jet pilot. If I have a fire on board, it's the scariest thing as a pilot and I need to land right away, I'm not gonna to call together the flight crew and say, hey, you guys, my objective is to get on the ground safely. And my assumptions are that we're burning and we've got about two minutes to get on the ground safely. And um, my criteria are that nobody die. And let's have a discussion about that. If the plane is burning, do the checklist, get on the ground, inform people later what you're doing. But how many times in business do we have a burning plane? No matter how dramatic it seems when a customer calls up and says, I'm canceling, it's not a plane on fire. So this process for strategic repivoting can really work. The last step of this process, um, the fourth step I could have said is weighing the ox. And, and Sherry, this is based on research and experience. And you know, in 1906 um, in the UK, Sir Francis Galton was an esteemed statistician. His little county town had a fair. And at that county fair, there was an ox. And Galton being a curious statistician said, I wonder if people can guess what the weight of the ox is. And so he had 787 attendees all write down the weight of the ox and every single one of them was wrong. Even though they all had farms, even though they all had seen oxes before, they were all wrong. But Dalton being the curious type decided to take the average of all the guesses. And all the guesses averaged were within one pound of the actual weight of 1,198 pounds. So the point is, all of us together are a lot smarter than any one of us alone. 
And it's not just for guessing the way of the ox. It's also for situations that are very critical. Hey, the, Dave, I, I've got a great question. I'm just going to interrupt you because I was thinking this myself. Um, the question from the audience is, this is great. We love this. But do different generations in the workplace approach decision making differently with half the workforce, millennials? And we got the baby boomers and now we got Gen Z coming in. How do you see that playing out? Oh, my goodness. That's a separate one hour conversation. <laughs> I would say, here are generalizations, gross generalizations. Okay. We often see people who have worked in a company, an organization for 20 or 25 years. They've worked hard to get to the corner office. By golly, they paid their dues. And the person in the corner office before them made the decision and told people what to do. And by golly, that's the role model. And so boomers I get reassurance from the leaders telling them what to do. Millennials, if they're told what to do, check out and say, whatever. Those are gross generalizations and we have X in the middle, but generations react very differently. But no matter what your generation, the average of all our ideas and all our experience is so much stronger than any one of ours, even if we have the most experience. And as you said before, it takes a confident leader to solicit ideas. What did this punk know who's been here three days? Well, you know what? They have a lifetime of experience. It's their lifetime and it's their experience and it could contribute if you as the leader set the proper framework. Set the proper framework. Yeah, that's great, Dave. I know I've always heard that millennials today, and again, gross generalizations, really want a coach, not a manager, and they don't want that quarterly review, right? They want to be checked in with and coached all of the time and, and even be told their flaws and how they can get better. So um, great comment. I, I also love how you said that um, this decision-making process applies to every type of decision. So whether we're hiring somebody new, whether we're thinking of what new products and services we need to do, and I think in our personal lives, and I'd love to get your feeling on that. As you were saying criteria, I realized I actually had criteria when I was um, looking for a mate back when I had. Now, you don't get all 20 criteria, nor do they. But is there something to be said for um, how much criteria you have? So, so, you know, do you say, well, I need these are the top three things or the top five things? Or can we as leaders have 20 different criteria or is that too much? You can bring 20 criteria to the table and then ask your team if they agree with those criteria, how do they rank the criteria? What criteria would they add? And that's a very rich discussion. And what you'll find is that three or four will fall out as the most important criteria. You know, we talked about hiring the other day and, you know, you say, I'm going to hire for somebody with three years experience in that. They've been a sales manager and managed a $50 million company and whatever. And those really aren't the criteria at all. Those are things they might have done on a resume. But what's really important is what's on the index card of what you're looking for. And sure, you went through that recently. What were your top criteria? Yeah, that was fascinating. And Dave, that's when you and I started talking. And I was originally looking for an executive assistant because my beloved executive assistant has to homeschool like so many mothers right now. And so my immediate reaction was, well, I need to fill that role. I need another executive assistant. Okay, she needs 10 years experience. She needs to be um, you know, really adept at these certain computer skills, et cetera, et cetera. But after talking to you and looking at my criteria, my assumptions, number one. And so I had an assumption that I needed an EA to do all this, these types of administrative tasks. But what was really interesting is then when I started looking at criteria and I thought, well, wait a minute, I need somebody who's really sophisticated. I need somebody who has a growth mindset. And I got to more of a values conversation. But what was interesting is I tested my own criteria. Why do I need an EA? And I realized right now with my pandemic pivot, see if you can say that three times fast, with my pandemic pivot, we're changing all our product offerings. Actually, what I need is somebody who can lead business development and marketing. So I had to challenge my own assumptions. And we asked everybody on my team, were my assumptions correct? And had I not talked to you and not gotten input from other team members, I wouldn't have made that pandemic pivot. Nice. So let's talk about the fourth step of weighing the ox of yeah. the business. So what this looks like is we've agreed with the team on the framework about clearly defined outcome, about our assumptions and about our criteria. We've collectively come up with that. 
When we go to weigh the ox, what we do is we ask each person to do their own brainstorming on what strategies could be or what our plan could be to meet these assumptions and criteria and outcome. So everybody does this work on their own and they write down um, their ideas. Then they get in small groups first to share the ideas. So they get feedback and get the shark on their thinking. And then we all get together as a team and list the ideas on a flip chart or a Google Doc or whatever we're doing, whether virtual or in person. And then we ask people to vote. No discussion, no discussion, silent vote, because I'm going to call on my experience and my intuition to place my votes. And cumulatively, we will weigh the ox. And what you'll find is our best thinking falls out. And what's important about it is it's our collective thinking. And I was part of it. I wasn't told what to do. I created our plan. And then you go through the other steps of planning. In fact, there are a lot of different steps here. We've put together an e-brochure that outlines these four steps plus the fifth step of learning and refining after a period of time. But if you'll text the word strategy to 31996 in the U.S. and Canada, if you text the word strategy to 31996, glad to share it with you if you're outside the U.S. or if you're not watching live. If you will just send an email to engage at Garrison Growth, E-N-G-A-G-E, engage at garrisongrowth.com, and in the subject line put strategy, we've got a brochure that lays it out that includes questions that you can ask and discuss with your team. Um, and it also has a, a special research piece on the seven reasons why strategies fall off the map, which happens more times. How many strategies do you have sitting on the shelf that never quite got executed because reality got in the way? So glad to provide that for free. Um, and it, it'll just step you through desired outcome, assumptions, criteria, thoughts, and then learning and refining. And Dave, now I have a burning question and I'm sure our audience does as well. So you had done these workshops all over the world for um, executive teams. And what's your pandemic pivot? Have you now taken this show and are you offering it virtually to people that are listening as well? Yes, it's interesting because we learned very quickly through some experts the best practices in Zoom. And what we found is most of our clients don't use Zoom rooms, don't use Google Docs in conjunction with Zoom, don't have the way to weigh the ox electronically. And when you do that, it's actually, some, in some ways, it's even more effective. Because, for example, if I wanted to get everybody's opinion on my assumptions, in Zoom land, I can have everybody respond at once in the chat box as opposed to having to go around the room, which takes a lot more time. So we've learned tips and tricks that mm -hmm. make this um, an effective time. And it's been an interesting pivot to virtual land and it can be equally effective as being in person. That's awesome. That's great. I've got a couple of more questions here, Dave. Actually, this one here is for me. Uh, so I'll take this. Um, one of our uh, listeners wants to know how this process is seen in sales. So my world really is working with sales teams. And, um, you know, it's a great question. Uh, I'm a thought leader with Gartner on their panel, and they have some really interesting new research about this whole topic. And I'm glad that uh, you asked that question and made the link. So here's something interesting to think about. The number one reason our customers don't buy today, according to Gartner, has very little to do with a competitor down the street really doesn't even so much have to do with them not trusting the seller, which it used to be years ago. It has to do that they don't feel confident in their own ability to make decisions. So, and also we know that in the average B2B sale today, we have not five, not six, but 11 average stakeholders, which means we have to help 11 people decide on our product or service, which is pretty interesting. And I just want to um, give you this quick soundbite, and that is this. Um, what Gartner shows and, and what we teach in our workshops is that there's three types of seller behaviors today, and only one is effective. And just to give a little context, and particularly in the pandemic, we are in a world of complete information overload today, right? In fact, neuroscientists tell us that we take in the equivalent of 175 newspapers per day of information. And we all know people would rather make no decision than make the wrong decision or stick to the status quo. So the three types of selling behaviors that we see today are number one, the giver of information. 
That's the seller that gives a white paper, gives more data, gives more information. Of course, the customer doesn't need that because he's or she is already overloaded with information. The second type of seller is the teller of information. The teller sort of like that chief information officer we talked about. And the teller says, hey, if I were you, I'd buy my product. Here's why. I'm wicked smart. I've been doing this for 20 years. Here's what I would do if I were you. Right. And that doesn't really have any credibility because we're also actually in an era of complete distrust. Right. Fake news, distrust. So people don't always trust that. The third type of seller, and I'm going to leave you with this because this really brings this full circle, is what they call the sense maker. So what a sense maker seller does is make sense of all of the information that the seller already got on his or her own, makes sense of it and shows them how to make a buying decision, what questions they should ask, what assumptions they may have, and what criteria they should use in order to buy a product like yours. So all of this translates into how we sell our products as well. But I got to think, Dave, and tell me if I'm wrong, that unless we can get the decision-making process right at the C-suite level, how in the world can we expect our sellers to get the decision-making right and help our customers make buying decisions? Absolutely. And despite the information overload and the 175 newspapers worth of information, what we don't ask the customer and learn about are their assumptions and their criteria. And when we know that, we're able to know right away, can we meet their needs or not? So I think it's right on um, in line with sales. So I've got one last question here, Dave, as we're uh, a little short for time. And actually, um, what this audience member wants to know is, if you could give, Dave, one piece of advice for global executives in these challenging times, what would it be? Um, actually, it's a two-part. It's a two-part because I can't help myself. One is to recognize your role in providing assurance about what's certain to your team. There's so much uncertainty. Recognize, acknowledge the uncertainty and pivot to what's certain. What's the same? You know, we still stand for the values of our vision still is. We're still somebody our customers are relying on. So pivot to the certain. And the second piece is to be curious. You do not need to make decisions if the jet's not on fire. You do not need to make decisions on your own. You need to get curious and include the team because it provides reassurance to the team as well. Sherry, thanks for joining me today. If you want to get great insights on selling, check out Sherry's best-selling book, Heart and Sell, available on Amazon, or you can connect with her on LinkedIn. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. And I want to thank YPO for hosting this amazing experience. This organization has changed my life and the relationships I've made have changed our families' lives as well. If you enjoyed today's episode, let us know by sharing it with your networks and subscribing to the YPO Presents channels. And until next time, this is YPO Presents.